<laughs> That's my favorite part. That's my favorite part of the entire Pink CD. Pink Floyd bringing us back. Our rejoins this week are songs written about a real person. Yes, they are. This was my choice. This was, of course, uh, written for the original lead singer, Sid Barrett of Pink Floyd, who... Uh, did he eat too much acid yeah, and go well, crazy? Because I mean, now what we know, know about MTA I don't know if that could be substantiated, but it certainly didn't help with his schizophrenia that, yeah. that he eventually uh, went into. Guy could write some music, though. It was written about Sid Barrett. Now, a lot of songs, Shine On You, Crazy Diamond. There yeah. was a ton of, a lot of Pink Floyd's work was uh, in, I don't want to say memoriam, because he didn't die until years later, but was, was with him in mind. Uh, really? Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How, Sid Barrett, how many... C Albums was he on? Oh man, he was on the early albums, probably like three out, three okay. or four albums. Uma Guma, like going back. I think okay. he stopped at like metal, probably. So sweet. We're gonna talk about Pink Floyd this entire. Hope you guys are locked in for some Pink Floyd talk with Dr. Mimi Vo. No, uh, guys, we have Dr. Mimi Vo in studio. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. We awesome. are uh, really excited about a, a lot of things that we have coming up here in the next month or so right. uh we've got obviously uh voting on november 6th we've got three medical cannabis initiatives yeah, never happened before which is first. pretty wild mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's uh i find myself i had somebody at my bni meeting the other day come up to me and say which way am i voting on this one again like yeah i know you know and i'm like <laughs> Well, you know, it's not, happening not to tell you, but here's the breakdown, and you're voting yes on two. And no it's on happening three. more and more. <laughs> you're voting yes on two, no on three, and no on two. Um, so, Mimi, what brought you? Uh, first off, give us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I grew up here in St. Louis, actually, in Webster Groves, and then I went off to medical school when I was 17 years old. I went to the University of Missouri, Kansas City, to six-year Kangaroos. program. That's right. So I um, graduated pretty early um, at the age of 23, really it Underachiever, huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I'm like a line of doctors, and so like I was always told, you know, drugs are bad. Don't do this. Don't do that. Yeah. And um, you know, never learned really much anything about cannabis at all during medical school or anything about it. It was in 2003 when I graduated, and it wasn't until I went to North Carolina for residency I had this progressive doctor who worked in a hospice care center. I was there for a month, and she said, hey, did you know cannabis can be used to for patients um, who are dying and used for, you know, nausea and chemotherapy? And she gave us articles to read, and I'm like, what? This wow. is illegal. Why are we talking about yeah, this? Yeah. You know, and um, it just kind of, she opened my mind to the possibility of it as a medicine. And then, you know, fast forward, that was in like 2004, 2005, like 13, 14 years later, you know, the whole landscape has changed. The The ideas we have about it has changed. And yeah. it's just, I've gotten a chance to do the research myself and actually see how it's helped my own patients now as a clinician and working with patients. Did so, they teach you about the endocannabinoid system? They didn't. I knew nothing about it. And How is that possible? Yeah, yeah we knew nothing about it at all. Um, all we learned was that it's not addictive uh, in medical school. That was the only thing we learned was cannabis was not addicting, although I n now know that that's not completely true. Yeah. It's, you know, caffeine is addicting, so is sugar and other things, but sure. it's mm -hmm. not completely not addicting. But, um, you know, as far as the endocannabinoid system, we knew nothing. And I actually didn't know nothing until a few months ago when I was like, you know what? I should probably learn about this. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I would meet people out in California or in Colorado and they're like, you don't know anything about them? Like, no, they didn't teach us. We don't talk about it. We're so busy in our doctor lives that I talk to other doctors and they're like, I've never heard of it. And uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so I became the healthcare and education chair of the Missouri Cannabis Trade Association. Okay. And my focus is to bring this knowledge that I've learned in the last year to physicians, to nursing staff, to other healthcare professionals in an easy way for them to learn because in their busy lives with all of their electronic mm -hmm. health record systems and all of that, they, and their children and they're, you know, just trying to be a person, just, just, you know, working as a clinician, how do I bring this to them? How do, how did I have time to carve out of my busy day to learn this? And so I'm, actively going out to different hospital systems and speaking um, mm -hmm. and teaching doctors during lunch because that's when they learn while they're eating. And that's that's what I'm doing right now. How is it received with your peers? You know, I would say um, in my own calculation, in my own head, out of 10 doctors that I talked to, like eight of them are like, wow, that's so cool. This is great. This mm -hmm. is great. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's promising. And another two will be like, I just don't have time for it. I don't have you know, I'm, I'm not going to do this, or I just don't believe in the research that's out there. But I think most of them are pretty excited that this is available. I mean, we can write for opium products, you know, we can sure. write for opiates, and yet we cannot write for cannabis. And that's just really unfortunate. So 
Oh, wow. Well, how have you seen uh, marijuana, uh, medicinal marijuana, how have you seen it affect uh, people? Because you're in St. Louis right now, mm -hmm. so we can't even, you know, recommendations. It's yeah. all about recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you have these talks, how does it, you know, is it just papers and like, because everything's anecdot anecdotal, we right. always find out. Mm -hmm. Like, it's always like, oh, you see this kid who has epilepsy yeah. on a video and then he, they give him cannabis oil and it mm -hmm. stops immediately. Mm -hmm. And other people be like, that's anecdotal. We haven't, and I'm big, I'm <laughs> yeah. stuck on the schedule one. Right. With they right. say it's no medicinal value. Right. So how right. do you kind of maneuver those, uh, that world? So, so it's interesting. As I looked and, you know, when I talked to other doctors, some of them would say, well, there's just no research out there. Yeah. And then I'll come back and say, well, have you seen this 2015 paper in the Journal of American Medical Association? If you're an internist, that's what we read. Um, or have you looked at all of this research papers? There's meta-analysis. There's things in the Cochrane data. There's actually stuff out there. It's just that we don't have time to read it. And then, you know, when I'm bogged down with reading about, you know, the newest cancer therapies, I'm not really having time or looking at cannabis research. So there's not great like double blind placebo controlled trials, yeah. which we like to have. Yeah, sure. There's great case reports. There's great meta analysis out there that yeah. show that it's effective for neuropathic pain. Um, meta analysis. For, meta analysis is where they pile together like tons of research papers and they read all of them and then they compile it together into one paper. And so, you know, there was one that looked at 28 different meta analyses and they said, yes, it's effective for neuropathic pain, that it is is helpful for nerve pain and it's helpful for spasms and it's helpful for chronic pain and it's helpful for, to reduce you know the dosages of opiates that we can use you know we could reduce morphine three the dosage by three times we can reduce the dosage of codeine by like 10 times if we use it with cannabis and i mean the beauty is that the endocannabinoid with the endocannabinoid system it's not in the brain stem so people can't stop breathing you know, you can't overdose to the point where you stop breathing, you die from it, and where you do with opium because sure. it, there's, there's receptors in the brainstem. And so in one article in 2015 in the Journal of American Medical Association, the states that have adopted medical marijuana laws, there was 25% deaths from overdose with opiates. And why is that? Because people are using with cannabis for pain. And so they're not needing to increase their dosage of opiates and they're not dying. With Interesting. Opiate, you know, yeah, because that's so, the thing with opiates. Yeah, you find the, yeah. uh, you know, you start at 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, whatever, you and then mm -hmm. you develop a tolerance. And mm -hmm. so you have to increase over time. And then you get all the side effects with the respiratory depression, where people stop breathing, the constipation, and all of those um, side effects from the opiates that you Oof. can mitigate if you use it with cannabis. For and sure. so, I mean, and that's one of the things that, um, you know, that one of the doctors said to me, well, tell me about you being so pro cannabis and then it being a gateway drug. Well, what I, in the research that I've done, it's not a gateway drug. It's an exit drug. Really what we're yeah. seeing is that it's being used to get people off addictive substances, other addictive substances. And one of the research studies in California showed that people are using 40% of people use cannabis to get off alcohol. 66% of people are using it to get off prescription drugs. I mean, wow. if there is something that's safer than Tylenol or safer than opiates and safer than alcohol, to me, that's an exit drug. Absolutely. It's not a gateway drug. Absolutely. And, and I, I just, that in itself, I think speaks volumes. And it's, um, you know, that's why Washington University and Dr. Addy Poe is doing research in cannabis and opiates. I mean, it's, it's just remarkable. But Really, when I started looking into this, and you asked about it being illegal here in Missouri, um, my patients come to me, and they will say, you know, when I, I have to ask them the normal things I ask, you know, do you drink, do you smoke alcohol, do you use illicit drugs, and some of them will say, well, I kind of use marijuana, and I'll <laughs> say, well, what are you using it for? And then they open up to me, because they, sure. they feel like they can, yeah. and they'll say, well, I'm getting it from Colorado, I'm driving over there, I have a friend in California who mails it to me, and I'm using it for PTSD. I'm using for anxiety and it works really well. And I feel like I am using for this pain and it works so much better. And, and I'm happy for them that it's working, but I'm really sad that, you know, we, they have to do it in an illegal oh, sure. way. Mm -hmm. And there are many patients who are not willing mm -hmm. to go that route sure. and who, who could mm -hmm. be getting help from it, but they can't because they're, you know, they're not willing to navigate that system and go at it in a legal way. Yeah. You know? so, and there's people who aren't educated about it as well. Right. And so that's right. creating a huge issue. Yeah, absolutely. So what are, what are the normal uh, duties of an internist? What would you specialize in? Is that kind of a general medicine? Yeah. Thing? So uh, an internist, so 
you know, family medicine does a little bit of everything. And then you have your pediatrician who takes care of kids. And then I'm an internist who focuses on adults. Okay. So our three years of training is in hospital medicine. We take care of patients with heart attacks and cancers, liver, kidney disease, and um, really focused on the adult. So I'm specialized in adult medicine. Okay. All right. Now we uh, hear the term that you guys call cannabis a catch-all because it, it works on all these different things. And we've kind of, you know, we've done our, tried to do our own research too, um, where, you know, a lot of maybe the same ailments come from inflammation or something, you know, yeah. where you're seeing a lot of the same. Uh, Autoimmune. For, yes. Yeah. So where, where do you see cannabis helping, uh, you know, as far as those lines yeah. go? So I think the number one thing that can be used for, and it is being used for now, is for pain. And pain encompasses so many things. I mean, there's migraine pains, menstrual pains, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of pain. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very effective in pain. It's very helpful with like spasms and neuropathic pain, which are all types of pains. But the newer research is looking at the endocannabinoid system and a deficiency of endocannabinoids mm -hmm. in our body. And so Dr. Russo is doing that research since 2004 and looking at you know, diseases where there is an endocannabinoid deficiency possibility as a reason for patients to have these symptoms. So migraine, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, anxiety, depression. Maybe that's why we can't figure out a best way to treat these diseases is because we haven't identified what is the common component is the, where's the problem? Yeah. And so in, in some of these patients, yep. it, that's the, that's where I'm seeing these patients come to me and say, you know, my fibromyalgia pain is better, or my migraines are so much better. My mental, you know, I'm I'm just doing much better with my anxiety and my PTSD. We just maybe that genetically is is patients are predisposed to these illnesses because they have a lack of the endocannabinoid, you know, Receptor. receptors, and then or the they're not making enough endocannabinoids. Yeah. They're not not making enough anandamide and. Yeah, not. the bliss molecule. Well, and, yeah. and with it being illegal still, that there's still, uh, for people just coming to it, they might only think that you can only smoke it or, right. you know, yeah. one of my big regrets right. I, I talked about with my dad was he had a, an internal stomach cancer and he did, uh, uh, he smoked to help with nausea and, and pain. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, had we, you know, I just wonder what if, you know, had we had an RSO and some, and, and fed right. more edibles and actually put it into, into that spot because it was, uh, you know, he, uh, peritone, his, Peritoneum, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, peritoneal cancer. And so they said basically there was no way they would have ever found it because yeah. his appendix would have had to burst for them to yeah. have gone in there and found this sack. And, and so I wonder, you know, had he been ingesting more uh, uh, cannabinoids versus just, you know, just smoking them, how, if, it, if it would have, what kind of difference right. it might have made, if it would have mm -hmm. slowed things down, yeah. if it would have mm -hmm. helped with the intestinal matting, mm -hmm. you know. So that's, um, that's another myth that I hear is you're smoking cannabis, it's going to cause lung cancer, you know, and there's study, there's a study out there that looked at people who smoked cannabis versus those who didn't. And there was, was equal or lower rates of lung cancer. And, those that smoked. Um, and the reason that we think that may be is because that's the newest part of research that we're finding with cannabis is its use in cancer treatments. Yeah. You know, it being used for um, glioblastomas, which are brain tumors yep. and um, these other like eye tumors mm -hmm. and really looking at it use in nerve tumors. And so maybe that's the reason why we're seeing this and we just haven't been able to research it, you know? Yeah. And I think that when we do, we're going to be hopefully finding a lot more that we, we can, can help treat. Sure. Um, but, th but that's the newer thing is vaporizing, mm -hmm. you know, tinctures, creams, and it's not just yeah. about smoking, you know, cannabis. There's a lot of the ways I would say most of my patients will do use it sure. in like an edible form or whatnot. Yeah. Sure. Okay. A little two-part question for you here. Um, all right. So CBD, THC, mm -hmm. uh, we're finding out different, you know, right. THC works well for some things. CBD works mm -hmm. well for other things. Uh, are you familiar with the, like the full plant spectrum? And do you yeah. think getting in a full plant spectrum is probably the way to go? I do. I do. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll go ahead and answer yeah. that one first. So I believe we'll, that there yeah. is an entourage effect. I believe that there okay. are things that we don't completely understand about the plant. And so there are a lot of these terpenes, different cannabinoids. There's 60 to 80 cannabinoids that they've identified and they probably have different um, pharmacological therapeutics to them. Sure. And we just haven't been able to identify all of it. Also the receptor takes THC and CBD in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that it's helpful together. And so if you're using just the CBD only products, it's probably, you're not probably getting all of the effects. Um, and I think that that's why, you know, GW pharmaceuticals in England, oh, in yeah. the UK is, um, 
get a lot of the research that's good quality research is from them, mm -hmm. why we're seeing the um, the good effects that we are, mm -hmm. and that's why the FDA approved, you know, the, yeah. the whole Epidiolex recently, yep. yeah. Now, yeah. How, do we have studies where it affects kids? Because we I, a study just came out the other day by, oh, I forget who it was, but saying, oh, cannabis is much worse for adolescent brains than alcohol, and the science was real iffy on it. Yeah. I, obviously, alcohol is... Jesus, yeah, alcohol. Yeah. I think about the things I did on alcohol. I'm like, what? You, yeah. What? <laughs> what? But uh, as far as that goes, it's kids. Do we have any studies that say? No. Uh, no. Yeah. So even to do research on adults, um, you know, I've talked to Dr. Sue Sisley out of Arizona, who's oh, doing yeah. the PTSD research yeah. uh, there, and all the hoops and the years that she's <sighs> been going through to get, you know, U.S. grade, you know marijuana from mississippi which she showed uh, pictures of it it's, it's not rough. very it's the good worst. it's yeah. rough it's and like so, lawn clippings right and so she said that she's only gone through like phase two trials with cannabis with adults and she and whereas with her mdma research she's been able to go to phase three so imagine if she we can't even get through hoops to study adults how are we going to study children Jeez. it's just not there but these case studies and me speaking to other um um, in other states and people even here who are treating children with CBD for seizures, they say, hey, I'd rather have a child who's awake and talking to me than one that's having seizures nonstop and not learning how to talk, not yeah. learning how to grow, yeah. not being able to walk. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe there are effects for their brain, but at least I have my child sure. alive and talking to me rather than not, you know. So I think that research is probably long long way away sure. but it needs to be done yeah that's really that's what upsets me so much because you have parents who are playing doctor yeah with yeah. their kids you know if my because kid was they seizing out right. yeah. they're like well how do i make this oil let me get online and try yeah. what are we doing I man? Know. and i guess I it starts with education you know we have the conference yes. coming up october 27th and 28th yes. you'll be talking yes, there, be talking there. So dr yes. sue sisley as a matter yes that's yeah. right dr yeah. sisley will be there too have absolutely. you talked to her much about the ptsd yes absolutely um we talked about her research and she feels like that she finds um the case studies are much better than her research because of that problem, because she doesn't have very good quality cannabis sure. to give out to patients. Um, but she she finds that it's, it's helping patients with PTSD. It's Absolutely. interesting that you said that her MDMA research is, is progressing <laughs> along because I follow I follow along with, with, with well with <laughs> maps and everything. And, and I see that they're making huge strides in treating depression and yeah, PTSD. Maps with not only MDMA, but also psilocybin and other entheogens or whatever your preferred mm -hmm. term is. Um, so it, I guess maybe because MDMA is maybe easier to measure doses and therefore do studies on, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Um, that's I, a bit I of a tangent. I think that there's just, um, there's a big group of people who are just anti-cannabis. And yeah, so the weird. government is just very anti-cannabis for some reason. And it's been there since the 1930s when it started. And unfortunately, that's the way things are. You yeah. know, people don't know, may not know a lot about MDMA. So they're like, sure. okay, that's that's fine. It's not um, a political issue or, you know. Yeah, it's just really a, interesting a, a to me. Big governmental issue. Would you say a lot of your peers struggle with like the opioid epidemic? Because Absolutely. 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 I was a physician um, out in Sullivan, Missouri, and I dealt with it on a daily basis, um, the opiate you know, epidemic and the opiate crisis that was out there and been able to help some of the patients out there get off of opiates. Mm -hmm. And because my, my father, who's a physician, he owned the practice out there and um, I worked with him and he was very much like, you know, we got to do things the right way. We've got to get people off of opiates and we've not, we've got to get people, you know, not addicted to prescription drugs. And so I worked really hard and it was a lot more work for me. Sure. You know, I had to call around different pharmacies, talk to their mother, talk mm -hmm. to their father, get their whole community to help them out, you know. Um, whereas it would have been so much easier for me just here, here's this prescription. What do you want? Here you go. Let's, right. You want more today? Let's get more, you right. know. So um, some of the, some physicians feel like it was so easy for them to keep writing prescriptions and that just created the epidemic to go forward. Sure. Um, and now that it's such a hot button issue that, you know, and physicians are, are, are losing their licenses for writing yeah. these prescriptions. That's it's, it's a lot more uh, round upon and it's, it's looked at, but I think that it's going to be something that this is going to help the cannabis as a medicine is going to help. With so that. we talked to you a little bit. You're going to be speaking at the conference uh, mm -hmm. with Dr. Sue Sicily, Dr. Jeffrey Hergen, rather, there's going to be several doctors and medical professionals mm -hmm. there. Um, I, I imagine as, as somebody who, who wants more science and everything just to help prove the point, um, there, there, is a, there is a point when it comes to legislation where you're like, 
just give me more than what I got. Yeah. But of the three initiatives, and I don't want to put you on the spot, feel yeah. free not to answer. Um, you know, give us a breakdown. What do you think is the best or, or give, give me a few reasons why maybe, yeah. uh, you know, looking at a certain initiative is the so way to go. I am all about yes on two. Um, New Approach Missouri has the legislation written out in plain terms. It says, you know, how many dispensaries, how many cultivation licenses it will award. And I think that makes it so that it'll be the quickest to get cannabis as a medicine to my patients. It'll allow patients to, for some home grow, if they apply for a license, I think will help in patients in rural areas who won't be able to make it to big city centers. Um, and I think and it's the most similar to what Colorado and you know rolled out or Washington rolled out, um, you know, for the the amendment three, um, Dr. Brad Bradshaw's amendment. I just feel like there's nothing really plain in writing. We have no idea what he's going to decide, what medical conditions it'll be, um, and that makes me nervous because hey, he'll take care of it. It's Don't kind worry. of unheard of for somebody yeah. to okay. write themselves literally into law. That's yeah, kind of unheard of. It is. Listen, it guys, I'm going to take care of all the cannabis <laughs> stuff. Trust me. Okay, I'm good yeah. for it. And, 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 you know, he wants to do this research facility, and I'm all about research, but there are research facilities out in California, in Canada, and in the UK, in, you know, Italy, in Germany. They're there's also a private Israel. market solution, there's, yeah. There's lots of research being done already, and I just don't believe that that's, this is it. You know, Springfield, Missouri is going to be the center of cannabis research in the world. I just, I, I think that we should build upon what research is already being done, instead yeah. of starting from scratch and doing something completely new. I don't think that that's going to be helpful for our patients in Missouri. We shouldn't be, you know, having our, our patients here in Missouri as guinea pigs, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. without giving us too much, what are you going to be touching on at the uh, conference October 27th yeah. and 28th? So I'm going to touch on um, medical therapeutics of uh, cannabis and, and really rolling out the, showing the research data that's available. So Perfect. I'll go through, It'll be a little brainy, but I'm going to go through some of the journal articles that are out there, some of the research that's already been done. Hey, look at your really look at you're dealing with. We're yeah. brainy guys in here. Okay, yeah. you can tell. <laughs> and you'll all enjoy it. It'll be good. I'm just going to end up the day oh. with going through that, and then you know how the different um, conditions that are going to be approved, hopefully approved in and for for uh, medical cannabis in Missouri and touching on some of those different conditions and how medical marijuana can help them. As an internist, uh, you know, I, I feel like just from the outside looking in, the, the people that I want most in control of my access to medicine is the person that I'm that has all of my uh, health <laughs> details, my doctor. So uh, that's one thing that uh, really turns me on about Yes On Two is the fact that it really empowers you in your job, in yeah. your expertise, yeah. and and who you know, you you know your patient better than anybody else. You know, uh, better than somebody, better some bureaucrat in Jeff City uh, deciding whether or not their their ailment is uh, worthy of of this medicine. So that's why for me, yes, on two such a such a big deal is that it, it empowers people like you who are actually doing the research, who actually are sitting with your client, and um, and taking care of them. Mimi, we are up against a little bit, so we want to give you one last chance to, to leave, our, leave our listeners with uh, one, one final thought about uh, what you're working on and about cannabis, and yeah. uh, we can't thank you enough for coming. Oh, thank, thank you, so, you. Much. so much. Well, I'm just excited about cannabis coming to Missouri and patient, my patients being able to go and pick out what strain is going to be best for them, for their yes. condition, choosing the dosages that's right for them. Um, you know, not, not worrying about pesticides and molds and worrying about, you know, being caught and doing this in an illegal way. I'm excited about being able to tell my patients to try something and it may not work. Just like when I try Tylenol, it doesn't work or Motrin, it doesn't work. It may not work, but at least I have that possibility. It's going to be one of six different classes of pain medications I can use. Like I'm using opium now, you know, mm -hmm. as a medication. So so oh, Dr. Mimi came in here and we are just about two bobos and we've been spouting off stuff kind of like this for like <laughs> yeah, fine. So now we've been, 18 weeks. We've been corroborated. <laughs> I feel like someone came in here and they're, everyone, all everyone Validated? Are, our listeners are like, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah, no, we've been trying we've to been tell you this all along. <laughs> what the heck? Guys, thank you so much for joining us for this yeah. first hour. Uh, brought to you by James Carlton State Farm. Check out carltoninsurance.net, yeah. 314-961-4800. He made that interview possible, and that interview yeah. just knocked my socks off. Mimi Vo, <laughs> Dr. Mimi Vo, we appreciate you coming in. Can't Thank wait you. to see you at Thanks, the conference. Um, we'll check back in with you. A oh, real quick question. How has AI uh, kind of wiggled its way? <laughs> and I'm a big AI guy. I'll ask you after the commercial break. I'm sorry. <laughs> Guys, this is Hoosier Sophisticate on WGNU920AM.com and HoosierSophisticate.com. We'll see you on the other side.